Mastering the following six elements of product discovery is the key to delivering products that solve real problems for users and drive the strategic priorities of your company. Let's start with creating alignment to enable team autonomy. Almost every product manager knows this situation. Some of your stakeholders keep coming up with particular features they want you to build into your product. Why is this bad? Because it immediately focuses on the solution space without understanding the problem space. And if this has happened to you, it was probably because of a lack of trust. Some stakeholders just don't believe that the output your team will deliver will match their expectations. And the best way to resolve this issue is to focus on alignment early on in product discovery and commit to a particular outcome rather than features. But how do we do that? Create clarity around the why of the product discovery scope. Without this clarity, your product team could end up solutioning or falling for confirmation bias down the road. Clarity around strategic context is low with solution-focused alignment and high with problem-focused alignment. In solution-focused alignment, the team involvement mostly includes receiving information, whereas problem-focused alignment is the result of co-creation on eye level with everyone involved. Effort to create clarity in solution-focused alignment is usually limited to details about the solution, whereas problem-focused alignment includes goals and ambition-level thinking. Setting priorities in a solution-focused alignment looks like defining specific tasks, whereas problem-focused alignment would encourage exploring areas with the highest uncertainty. And finally, definitions of success in a solution-focused alignment are measured with deadlines and company-level metrics, and in problem-focused alignment, they're measured with best effort timeboxing and change behaviors. Next, we have to understand the most critical user problems. When thinking of how to research user problems, most teams jump immediately to interviews or send a survey. Though that isn't necessarily wrong, here are two even more important practices to adopt for more focused navigation of the problem space. Number one, clearly state your research intent questions based on the biggest areas of uncertainty before choosing and executing a given technique. Number two, make sure to collect insight from multiple angles to get to the truth that lies at the intersection of multiple perspectives, such as direct observation of behavior, indirect measurement of behavior, what people do, and indirect sampling of reality. And remember that you don't need to engage in new research activities right away. It might make sense to turn existing sources of continuously incoming feedback into tangible evidence lockers. Once you understand the problems your users are dealing with, it's time to start thinking about how to solve them. Which brings us to number three collaboratively ideating solutions that drive changes in behaviors. The primary goal of the best ideation exercises is to get people out of their comfort zone and to think bigger. Reality will catch up soon enough. Let's reach for the stars at this stage of product discovery. But let's say you've already created a list of great ideas. How do you prioritize that? Dot voting is an effective and lightweight way to do this and can take you from 40 ideas to 10 in just one session. And the ideas that get lost in the process because nobody voted for them, forget them. If an idea is truly great, it will come back during future iterations and eventually find its way into the highest priority buckets. So how do we execute our new ideas? Prototype experiences. Though prototyping tools are the shiny objects of product discovery, you don't actually need to use them. Instead, Focus on simulating an experience to test the ideas in front of you. And remember, this isn't always defined through a UI. I know with all the flexibility and power of modern no-code tools out there, it can be tempting to fully build out your idea instead of sticking to the experiment scope that's required for testing the assumptions behind it. David Blunt has a great piece of advice for teams that find themselves in this position. He writes, I still advise teams that they should defer building as long as possible, and though this hasn't changed, the sheer cost, time and capabilities needed to do a software mashup MVP are rapidly plummeting. Prototyping should be about testing your product hypothesis, nothing else. And it goes hand in hand with key element number five, testing the most critical assumptions of discovery ideas through experiments. An assumption describes a thing that is accepted as true or is certain to happen, but without proof. An experiment, on the other hand, is the scientific procedure undertaken and needed to test an assumption. You should start by listing the explicit assumptions that must be true about an idea, and then you can select an experiment technique. 
Too many teams jump straight into the one experiment technique they always use right away. It's also crucial your experiment technique helps you to collect strong, actionable signals without getting lost in waiting for overly sophisticated experiment setups to be ready. To think about this, let's look at something I call the evidence validity matrix. In general, the strength or weakness of signals generated by experiments is determined by two major factors. One, the degree of user action commitment. The degree of commitment a user experienced or articulated through your experiment. And two, the proximity to user action. The difference between anecdotal evidence and first-hand experiment data. These two attributes can be combined in our matrix to form four categories which most of the signals generated by typical product experiments fall into. First, real user intent backed up by qualitative or quantitative data. This is generally based on second-hand user interactions or publicly available anecdotes. Second, quantitative or qualitative data resulting from experiments you actually ran. This usually is simulating hard choices for customers. Third, reported intentions to buy or use a suggested feature or product or self-convicted theories about what users would do. Finally, fourth, qualitative or quantitative experiments but composed mostly of fluffy interview questions or measurement of vanity metrics. All right, so let's say after all this, you've arrived at a set of validated assumptions and ideas that are ready for a first iteration or MVP for a real product. Now it's time to redefine validated ideas for focused delivery. If you're like most of us, your first releases or MVPs were just crappy versions of all the initially planned features released just to hit an artificial deadline. Now, no need to beat yourself up about that. But to level up delivery, I advocate for a reduced scope MVP, which doesn't compromise on quality, but prioritizes the most valuable features. I also recommend slicing a concept into a prioritized list of backlog items and think about potential releases. The overall vision for your product or feature idea will guide you along the way, but it shouldn't prevent you from shipping earlier iterations to learn from your users. The days of building and releasing a complex product in one monolithic effort are over. The most important thing to remember about these six key elements of product discovery is that they almost never happen in a perfectly linear process. During or after the validation phase, it's likely that you need to take a step back. Whether it's to pick new ideas to test from your ideation sessions or whether you return to the initial research phase, it can be painful to go backward. But going backward is still more important than moving forward just for the sake of it. And for a video where I do dive specifically into how to structure these six key elements into an effective and adaptable product discovery process, click here.